Here we go. Uh, first thing I'm going to tell you right now, this last question, number five, the roller coaster question, not part of your quiz. So this quiz is actually going to be out of uh, 13, not 16. Woohoo! An airplane, it says, turns a complete horizontal circle in two minutes. Ha, huh, nice try. 120 seconds, you're not going to get me that easy. If the plane's speed is 170 meters, what's the radius of the circle? Well, for this question here, they're giving me the speed and the want, they want to know the radius. They haven't given me an acceleration. I have to use circular speed. Now, circular speed, speed going around a circle, centripetal velocity, we said you could figure it out by distance over time. Can you see the meters per second hidden in there? But what's the distance around a circle? 2 pi r. And what's the time to go once around a circle? Why, we called that the period. Rob, let's get the R by itself. Where would the T move? To the top. And what about the 2 pi? So I think you're going to say V T over 2 pi. V, 170. T, 120. 2 2 pi pi and I get 170 times 120 divided by bracket 2 pi I get a speed of about 3,250 meters per second 3,250 meters per second which at first seemed fast and then went, oh no wait a minute it's an airplane that's 3 kilometers um, out 3 sorry that's Three, yeah, three kilometers a second. Oh, yeah, they can go that fast. Yo. Radius, of course. That makes more sense to me, Mr. Duick. Thank you, Alex. 3,250 meters, which doesn't bug me. That makes like a... Uh, yeah, plane turns big circles. I'm okay with that. This equation, not on your formula sheet, but it's still did I try and show you how to derive it. It is distance over time in disguise. It's meters per second in disguise for circles. Now I can do, oh, by the way, I would probably go one mark if I saw that, half mark for that, and a half mark for the answer. I'm also going to mention, I ref yesterday after school, I ref two games the day before, I ref and announced Tuesday night. My voice is on its last legs. I'm very happy to be teaching you right now. I'm having fun. But all I have right now is angry, low voice if I try. I'll, nothing comes out if I go higher and more pleasant. So if it seems like I'm lecturing you guys, it's not. That's how I'm getting through today. Alex, you had a question. Uh, yes, but it won't make a difference unless you're pressing sine or cos or tan, which we haven't yet. Centripetal acceleration. Uh, AC equals... Well, I can either use v squared over r because they did give me the speed, or I can use 4 pi squared r over t squared because they gave me the period. I'd prefer to use one that didn't have an r because I don't like to use stuff that I calculated, but since they both have an r in them, I'll use the easier one, which is v squared over r. It's going to be 170 squared over 3250, except I'm not going to use 3250. I'll use the decimal value that's still stored on my calculator. I'm going to go 170 squared divided by answer uh, 8.9 meters per second squared almost but not quite one whole G and again I'd probably give you one mark for that half mark for that half mark for the answer anybody use the 4 pi squared r over t squared you get the same answer so that's fine number two now they want me to find the centripetal force I'm gonna say okay FC equals and I'm going to do a little bit of a defic data listing. I got the mass is 12. I got the radius is 6. That's pretty obvious. And then oh, they gave me the frequency, 5 hertz. The problem is none of my equations have frequency, and the my equations have period. How are frequency and period related? And I think this is on your formula sheet, is it not? Yeah. It's the reciprocal. It's 1 over 5, or 0.2 as a decimal. 
and now that decides it's going to be M A C. It's going to be M. I'm going to use the one with the period in it. Four pi squared r over t squared. It's going to be twelve times four times pi squared times six all over point two squared. And I got a pretty big answer. I got 71,000 newtons. 7.1 times 10 to the fourth newtons. And I said, wow, that's a huge force. And then I read the question and I said, hey, wait a minute. What's the mass in this question, Kathy? A bowling ball, basically. What's the radius that we're spinning this bowling ball around, Cassidy? From me to Itzel, roughly. So imagine me having a rope with a bowling ball in the end of it where Itzel is. And you know what? It's spinning around five times every second around. Uh, yeah, you know what? If you walked into that, it would kill you. Okay, you know what? I'm not that unhappy with that. That, that force now makes sense to me. I was nervous at first, but then when I stepped back, and actually almost seems low now because the force required to spin a bowling ball around that big of radius five times every second would be huge. In fact, a rope wouldn't do it. You need a chain or something, right? So I always try and ask, does the answer make sense? Yeah. Uh, by the way, same idea. One mark, half mark, half mark. Number five, a belt passes over a wheel of radius 25 centimeters, 0.25 meters. Nice try. If a point on the belt has a speed of that, what's the centripetal acceleration? So they want AC, and they gave me speed. So I'm going to go V squared over R. Speed is 5 radius squared, Mr. Duick. Radius is 25 centimeters or 0.25. And I can do this in my head. 5 squared is 25 divided by 0.25. Uh, 100? 100 meters per second squared. Now, I wouldn't take marks off for this, although they probably would on the old, they did on the old provincial. Why is this technically wrong? Because it is. How many sig figs? There's three. Or 1.0 times 10 to the 2 or whatever. They used to take marks off for sig figs on provincial exams. And then I marked the provincials about four years ago. And at the very beginning of that, they suddenly said, hey, let's not take marks off. And everybody was good with that. So I usually circle it on your test. I might take marks off once during a year, but usually I just think bad thoughts about you. Some of you more than others. I mean, okay, turn the page. Ferris wheel. Okay, at the top of the Ferris wheel, here's the person sitting. What are the forces acting on him? Normal force. But I know gravity has to be bigger because they're moving in a circle and the net force has to be pointing toward the middle. My equation here is going to be winner minus loser equals m. Uh, did they give me the velocity or did they give me the period? Ah, they gave me the period. And I think I mentioned to you that you'll find when we do go to land and analyze the rides, getting the velocity of the ride is tough. Getting the period is really easy. You start your stopwatch, and then you stop it when the same person comes back around. So most of the time, if it's moving in a circle, you'll be using this one. Oh, of course, once you have this one, you can calculate the tangent velocity. Really cool. The one, if, have you been on the uh, revel, revelation, the big thing that goes... I've been on there once. You've been on there? If you if you want to, you can analyze that one. Find the tangent speed. It's stunning how fast you're traveling on that ride. You are more than street legal. You're, so you're doing more than 60K, well, considerably more than 60 kilometers an hour, sitting in a porch, that porch uh, swing set, right? Because really that's what you're sitting in. A little stronger, but it's the old porch swing sets that they used to make. Very cool. That's the only ride I've gone on where I genuinely went, wow, I'm actually frightened. Uh, mass, 65. 4 pi squared r 
nine. All over 45 squared. Oh, hang on, Mr. Duke. You got to do the math. Jeez, what am I? I'm just plugging in numbers. I haven't even rewritten the equation. That's dumb. Let's try that. How would I get the Fn by itself? I think plus this over and minus this over. I think the normal force is going to end up being... Huh, that was brilliant. Mg minus m for pi squared r over t squared. Is that correct? I hope. m, 65 times 9.8 minus 65 times 4 times pi squared times radius 9 divided by t... 45 squared. Tell me you get 626. Yeah? B. What about at the bottom? Well, at the bottom, I want normal force to be the winner and gravity to be the loser. Normal force is going to be bigger. It's going to be winner minus loser equals m4 pi squared r over t squared. It's going to be normal force equals mg plus m4 pi squared r over t squared. And conveniently on my graphing calculator, it's so I can just go second function enter and make the minus sign a plus sign, and that's a way lot less typing. I get 648 newtons. Ashley, what was the normal force at the top of the ride? What was the answer to A? What was the answer to B? Is there a big difference between those? That's why Ferris wheels are a tame ride. The bigger the difference, the better, in my opinion, the ride. So if you get a normal force of like 300 at the top and 800 at the bottom, ooh, you're feeling that. This, you'd probably only be able to tell that you were moving because of the wind on your face, not really because of the internal built-in accelerometer that our gut seems to possess. In fact, you could almost rank rides based on what percent they change your normal force. That would actually be an interesting physics way to rank a ride. Just thought of that. Number five. Now, number five, actually, I'm going to be doing this question towards the end of the unit. Number five requires both energy and centripetal force. I do like this question, I like this question, I like this question, but we're going to actually spend a half day looking at it, okay? So I'm just going to tell you the answer in the interest of time, because i got a whole lesson i got to get through. I know that's not great teaching, but shut up. Sometimes i got to cut corners. Do you have quiz version 1 or version 2? Quiz version 1? Answer is 30. Anybody get that? Really? Doing it this way? Give yourself two bonus marks because I'm impressed. In fact, give yourself three bonus marks because I'm impressed. The rest of you I'm ashamed of. No. And the bonus question is 14. Here's what we're really saying. When you're in a roller coaster loop, at the top of the loop, you can figure out the minimum speed you need to be at in order to get a normal force of zero. Oh, and if you know the minimum speed, do you know the kinetic energy at the top? Oh, did I say at the top of the loop you also have some potential energy? Okay. And then you can work your way backwards and figure out how much potential energy you have to have at the beginning so at the top of the loop you have enough potential to make it to the top and enough kinetic to make it around. And it is actually a beautiful answer because you end up with a nice tidy expression of 2.5 times the radius, but that's coming down the pipe. Give yourself a score then, please, out of count them, not 16, but 13, I think I said. Make sure your name is on and pass them in. If you want to get out the notes from last day, I will start out as per my usual routine by saying, hello, any questions you would like me to go over now is your chance to ask. Alex, you said you had a couple. Number seven. Okay.
What does question seven want us to find? What do they mean by gravitational field? Now, gravitational field, we said the symbol for that is that, which is 9.8 here on the equation. So we can calculate it. It's this, big G, big M over R squared. Now, again, this is not on your formula sheet, but I'm going to argue it doesn't need to be. It kind of pops out of the fact that all of you know that FG has always been MG. But now if FG is also M this mess, this mess has to be the same as our gravitational field. That's our conclusion here. So it's going to be that, okay? Which is going to be 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11, yes? It says twice the mass, so 2 times 5.98 times 10 to 24, right? Divided by, and what the radius? 5 times the radius? 5 times 6.38 times 10 to the 6th, all of that squared. I'll probably have to put the bottom in brackets with the squared outside. That's it. Now, if you did that, then I'm going to guess it's a calculator error. Have I gone on a big rant about how you really want to be practicing your calculators? Because these are ugly. This is about as complicated, specifically when you potential energy required to lift a satellite into orbit. That's a that that's where I stop trying to get things by itself and start just going to my calculator and plugging and chugging because to try and rearrange them is just not worth it. Is that okay, Alex? Yeah. And I think that should work. I hope I haven't tried it, but it should. Okay. Any others? give more okay so it's going to be this again mass of the earth but we're 2,000 kilometers up our radius is that but in kilometers so multiply that by a thousand and that's what's going to go there okay so 2,000 kilometers up you're still under gravity but you'd feel lighter it's 5.7 not 9.8 but if you drop something, would it still fall down and break? Yeah. I'd like to do more, but I think today we'll also make some of the other stuff clearer. Or you can ask me at the end of class or ask me next class. Hey, oh, nerdily cool. We're going to look at how orbits work. And it turns out the math is grade 8. It's going to be cross-multiplying. Shannon with a vengeance. But we can do some nerdily cool stuff. So Sir Isaac Newton came up with his law of universal gravitation. Cavendish was able to calculate G. And then somewhere along the line, somebody said this. Draw a force diagram for the mass M in orbit. Let's pretend Earth and Moon. And what we traditionally Simran do in orbit is we use a capital big M for the planet and a lowercase m for the moon or the satellite or the spaceship or the space shuttle or the space station. Hisham, what are the forces acting on this? Now normally I'd say get the obvious ones. Can I now? I'm in outer space. What path is this guy tracing out? There has to be a force pointing that way. What force is keeping this guy in orbit? Yeah. Gravity. In fact, the equation that describes anything in orbit starts out, Courtney, wonderfully simply. Gravity equals FC. Because there's no friction in outer space, so we don't even need to go winter minus lose right now. Yeah. then it can branch. Gravity is always the same. Big G, big M, little m over R squared. You can either go MV squared over R. I use that one if they give me or they ask me the speed or velocity needed to stay in orbit. Or 
Big G. Oh, that didn't work. Big G, big M, little m over R squared equals M4 pi squared R over T squared. I use that one if they ask me or give me how long it takes the satellite to go around the planet once. We're the U.S. military. We want a spy satellite to orbit the Earth every five hours. We would give them the period. They could calculate how high and then calculate how fast it needs to be going to keep it there. Turns out then, an orbit is circular motion with gravity as the inwards force. All of the astronauts in the space station right now are feeling gravity. Well, no, they're not. You just showed us a video yesterday of the guy playing baseball. Didn't look like he was feeling... I'm telling you, the force of gravity is acting on him. Huh? Patience. Example two. A 10,000 kilogram satellite is orbiting 20,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface. A says, write force equations. It's still, did I say orbit? Well then, the first thing I know with the force equation is, gravity is pulling me in a circle. B. What do they want me to find, Rob? In B. Uh, I'll use the V equation. I'm going to say, okay, big G, big M, little m over R squared, that's gravity, equals M V squared over R, because they talked about orbital speed. Hey. You guys notice something a little strange here? Turns out the space shuttle can orbit right next to the small satellite that it's releasing. Because what happens, not to the mass of the planet, but to the mass of the orbiting thing. Which makes it nice, because then the space shuttle can launch satellites by going into their orbit, going at the right speed, Basically, raising the satellite maybe 10 meters above from where it is, and then just letting it go, and we're good. And then the space shuttle can use engines to get out of there. Oh, I noticed one more thing. This R could move up to there. How many R's would I have on top? One. How many on the bottom? How many left? Turns out one of the R's will cancel. And I've got the V squared by itself already. Shannon, how'd I get rid of a squared? Turns out... Orbital speed is given by this. It's not on your formula sheet, Eric. I don't memorize it. Eric, you know what I memorize? This line right here, and then I can derive whatever I need to in about one second. It's cross-multiplying. Yes, with a vengeance, but it is cross-multiplying. Oh, let's find out how fast it needs to be going. Let's see. G is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. M is 5.98 times 10 to the 24th. That's the mass of the planet. Divided by, oh, we got a little problem here. You see, this question gave us the altitude in kilometers. I think that's what it is in meters, is it not? Have I got an extra zero? Plus must do it times a thousand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, no, yeah, I'm good. Two times ten to the seventh. The problem is, Alex, my equation wants r. Now r That's my orbital radius. How can I figure out the orbital radius if they've only given me the altitude? What do I have to do or include? Andrew just figured it out, I think. I'm going to have to add the radius of the Earth in. You just have to read carefully. Sometimes, I will almost always just give you the orbital radius, but 
sometimes they'll give you the altitude, and the altitude is more practical because radar works from the altitude, not from the center of the Earth, but whatever. Over here, let's write down orbital radius is going to be the radius of the Earth plus the altitude. It's going to be, what is the radius of the Earth? I know it's 6.38, but I can never remember that times 10 to the... Okay, 6.38 times 10 to the 6th plus 2 times 10 to the 7th. That's the number that's going to go here, which I think ends up being 2.638 times 10 to the 7th. Double check my math. Is 6.38 times 10 to the 6th plus 2 times 10 to the 7th equal to plus 6.38 times 10 to the 6th? Yeah, 2.638 times 10 to the 7th. And now, once again, I really encourage you. The other reason I'm so bullish on getting you on your calculators now is you get faster at finding the scientific notation and the pi buttons and the square root buttons, and that saves you time on the test. So try it. See if you get the same thing. I get an orbital speed of that. 3888. 38, I think 3888. 3890 if I go to 3666. Yes? No? No? Yes? No? Did you get that? I'm looking at you, Steph. Did you get that? Oh, you did. Okay. Did you get that? Okay. Oh, okay. Nobody was nodding or anything. I was like, maybe I'm wrong. Carson? Yes? Oh. Although with Carson now, I'm more nervous. No, never mind. Good. Which seems fast, but then I went, actually, no. When I see satellites, it only takes them about 30 seconds at night to get across the entire sky. So, yeah, okay, that, that seems about right. And again, Brandon, notice, turns out, orbital speed ends up being independent of how heavy the object is. It costs no more to keep the space station up there than it does to keep a tiny little spy satellite up there. Ah, it costs way more to get stuff up there the heavier it is, and we'll talk about that in a couple of days. But once it's up there, mass is canceled. So here's our equation. Orbital speed is equal to the square root of big G, big M over orbital radius. Courtney, do I memorize that? No, I write FC equals FG, and away I go. Some kids, though, like to memorize stuff. There it is. Example 3. It says, fill in the proof below to show that when an object is in orbit, its inwards acceleration is the same as the gravity field at that distance. Now, we already said this. Alex reminded us earlier, gravity field is equal to big G, big M, over R squared. That's the gravitational field strength as you move further and further away from the Earth. Here it says A equals, well, V squared over R because we're moving in a circle. Yes? And... If I substitute, now it wants me to substitute V, look up, equals this. I'm going to be clever. I'm going to substitute V squared equals big G, big M over R. I'm going to get rid of the square root by squaring because there's a squared over here anyways that I'm going to plug it into. V squared is G, M over R. And if I plug this then it's into here for V squared, I'm going to get this, big G, big M over R, over R. How many R's on the bottom? There's two of them. Those don't cancel. Trust me. You get big G, big M, over R squared, which is exactly the same as that. Now, what does that mean? 
That means that all astronauts, all satellites, the space shuttle, the space station, anything in orbit is actually in free fall. It's falling to the Earth. Huh? It's falling to the Earth. No, it can't be, Mr. Dulick. Otherwise, things would be crashing down. I'm telling you, it's falling to the Earth. No, not slowly. Very rapidly. Ah! But watch, Rob. Here's the explanation. In an ingenious analysis of orbits, Newton imagined standing on top of a large mountain. So let's suppose you're a baseball player standing on top of a large mountain, and you throw the baseball as hard as you can. It'll land right there. Now you do some steroids, and you throw it even harder. Oh, it'll actually make it partway around the curvature of the Earth before hitting. Yes? Rob, is it not possible that I can find just the right speed so that when I throw it, it's falling, but it's also moving sideways at just the right speed to match the curvature of the Earth and keep going and going and going. That's what an orbit is. They're all falling, but we give it just the right sideways circular velocity so that as they fall, they curve at exactly the same curvature of the Earth. So even though they're in free fall, very rapid free fall, they never get any closer. That's orbit. And that's why the astronauts can be in gravity but not feel any mass because so the fact that an object in orbit is in continuous free fall is interesting for a couple of reasons it means that things in orbit are always falling to the earth even though they never get any closer it explains why astronauts seem to float around in the space shuttle both the passengers and the ship are in free fall and since the air that they're inside is in free fall with them they can't tell that they're moving Therefore, the ship cannot exert a normal force. And I've said to you the past few days, Ashley, what you think of as weight is not. It's the normal force. They still have full mg, but they have no normal force, so they feel weightless. And it also means that astronauts experience, can experience continuously, until they get used to it, the stomach feeling of falling. That's why you throw up a lot on the vomit comet. That's how you get used to it you deal with a lot of vertigo because right now, Spencer, one of the ways that you keep your balance, your inner ear has some liquids in it that always get pulled towards the ground and that's how you can close your eyes and know where the ground is even with your eyes closed. With that gone, if you don't know where the ground is, you feel dizzy all the time until your brain compensates. So they deal with vertigo, they throw up a lot, and then they get used to it. Although on the Apollo moon landings, a couple of the astronauts apparently never did get used to it. We're throwing up all the way there and all the way back. Yes. Okay. Does that make sense how orbits work? In fact, if you wanted to, you could orbit around the Earth a couple of hundred meters up, although you'd run into mountains. You'd have to be careful. And, well, let's see. Next page. In a cartoon... A character kicks the football the wrong way, but the football goes all the way around the earth and still goes through the uprights. I think it's a Popeye cartoon, if I recall. Removing the fact that it's a cartoon, if you did want to orbit around the earth, what speed would you have to be traveling if you wanted to orbit right at ground zero? Did I say orbit? Well, then, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write gravity is always big G, big M, little m over R squared. Centripetal force is M... In A, are they asking for, or do they mention the speed or the period? Speed, I'll use the V squared over R. Yay, the mass is canceled. Yay, one of the R's cancels. And in fact, I get what we wrote on the box on the previous page. The velocity is going to be the square root of big G, big M, over R. How fast would you need to kick a football? C, 
6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. 5.98 times 10 to the 24th. All over. Oh, mass of the Earth, 6.38 times 10 to the what? Sixth. Thank you. I can never remember that stupid thing. What's your orbital speed if you wanted to orbit here on the Earth? You'd have to be a couple of hundred meters up, but a couple of hundred meters with the radius won't make a difference. It'll make a difference like on six. Technically, you could argue it was 6.38000000002 to be a couple of hundred meters off the ground, so you wouldn't run into trees and things, but whatever. Close enough. What'd you get, it, Cassidy? 79? Yeah. Almost 8, kilo eight kilometers a second. Almost. It's pretty fast. Although we can get objects going that fast. Burns a lot of fuel. I'm curious. I wonder how long it would take to get around the Earth at that speed. Oh, Alex, what has B asked me to find? Oh, okay. I'll do that over here. Are we in orbit? Well then, gravity equals circular. Big G, big M, little m over R squared equals M. Ah, this time, Alex, I'm going to use the one with the period in it. 4 pi squared R over T squared. Once again, Andrew, the M's cancel. But what are we trying to get by itself this time? T. Now, this is a little bit more complicated. It's still cross-multiplying. First of all, this R here, Spencer, does not cancel with this R. In fact, if I moved it down diagonally, you know what I'd end up with? There's going to be an R cubed. In fact, you ready? I'm going to move the T squared to there, the R squared to there to give me an R cubed, and the big G, big M to there. I'm going to get this. T squared equals 4 pi squared r cubed all over big G, big M. Eric, how do you get rid of a squared? Oh, let's do that. I'm going to get cheating. This is our second equation. Okay, by the way, can you see why I don't bother memorizing these? So trying to keep these straight would be dumb, but I can get that and cross multiply. This is if you know the radius and you want to know how long it takes to go around, here you go. Do I know R? Yep. Do I know G? 6.67 times 10 to negative 11. Do I know the mass of the Earth? Hey, it is plug and chug now. Ugly, but yes. 4 pi squared, 6.38 times 10 to the 6 cubed, all over. 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. 5.98 times 10 to the 24th. And then square root that puppy when you're done. How long would it take you to go all the way around the planet at this speed? Backdoor, Alex, what'd you get? One point two times ten to the twenty-five seems really high to me. Did you square root? 
Is it 1.2 times 10 to the 25? I don't think so. Simran, what'd you get? Yeah. Oh, no, not that. So the negative 7 takes you to into a second. In fact, I think you're going faster than light right now. Okay. I better type this. 4 pi squared times 6.38 scientific notation button to the sixth all cubed. You might need to put this in brackets on your scientific calculator. On the TI, I don't, but you might have to divide it by bracket. 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 times 5.98 times 10 to the 24th. Square root of this. You get an answer right around a five, five, right? Five thousand seventy. Or just because I'm a nerd, if I divide that by sixty, about eighty-five, eighty-four and a half minutes. Pretty much eighty-four minutes thirty seconds. Um, problem. C. Why can't we orbit the Earth's surface in this manner? But it's very possible on the moon. What's the big issue here? Air resistance friction. You'd have to keep firing your jets. But on the moon, you would not. We could, if we do ever have a settlement on the moon, which apparently Newt Gingrich promised to do yesterday or the day before in one of the presidential debates. I think he wants to turn the moon into state number 50. Or 53 if you count Iraq and Afghanistan. Um... <laughs> Well, yeah, I don't know, you know, right? You know. <laughs> but it would be very possible to simply measure the highest mountain on the moon, go, let's say, 200 meters higher than that for a safety margin, and put stuff in orbit right there. And as you can see, the orbital period would be pretty quick, like every couple of hours. Very doable. But not here on the Earth, air resistance. On Mars? Possibly. Right. Turn the page. All right. Let's do the uh, U.S. spy satellite question that I bounced off you early. So we're NASA and the U.S. military comes and they say, look, we want to put a spy satellite up there and we want it to orbit the Earth every 300 minutes. Oh, hang on. 300 minutes, how many seconds? What'd you get, Sabina? 18,000. Every five hours. So we want a satellite to orbit the Earth every five hours. Okay, how high do we need to put it? Did I say orbit? Well then... Right? And Newton's, by the way, we can't use mg here because you're not on the Earth anymore. You're out in outer space. G has gotten smaller. So, got to use big G, big M, little m, all over r squared equals m. Which acceleration equation am I going to use for moving in a circle? The one with the v or the one with the t in it? How do you know? Oh, they gave me the period. Okay. So the 4 pi squared r over t squared. Oh! Which is good because the CIA wasn't going to tell us how much it weighed. It's in a box. Fine. Well, no, they would have to tell me how much it weighed for fuel on the way up. Uh... Does an R cancel? Uh, no. If I had R's on the bottom, they would cancel. But uh, what are we trying to get? Oh, we're trying to get the R by itself. This is about as tricky as it'll get. We're going to move the R up to here. How many will I have over here? Three of them. The T squared there and the 4 pi squared there. We're going to get this. R cubed equals GM T squared all over... 4 pi squared. 
And this is like the first time in Physics 11 or Physics 12 where I have to ask you, how did I get rid of a cubed cube root? Hey, cube rooting is useful. Yeah, it does show up somewhere. R is going to be the cube root of big G, big M, T squared, all over 4 pi squared. By the way, have you clued in why I've, why I've said don't bother trying to memorize all these different ones? Because they all look very, very similar with squares on the top and the bottom, and they're inside root. Ah, know that and derive it. Let's see. The cube root of... This is also your chance on some of your calculators to figure out where the cube root function is. Mass orbiting around the Earth. The period, 18,000 squared. All over 4 pi squared. Once again, do the inside, get an answer, and then cube root your answer. It's way easier. Squared divided by 4 pi squared. Double check before I hit 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11, 5.9. Yeah, it looks good. Cube root on my calculator is math, option number four, cube root. And I get an orbital radius of 1.4848 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Which is not what they wanted, by the way. But first of all, see if you can get this on your calculator. If you can't, now is your chance to call me over and I'll try and figure out how your cube root system works on your calculator. We're good. Anybody see it's very subtle. Why is this wrong? Why is this not what they actually asked me? Yeah. If they want to know how high above the Earth, what I found is how far from the center of the Earth. I found its radius, orbital radius. How can I find its altitude? The height is going to be R orb minus R Earth, whatever's left, right? Does that make sense, Nav, if you visualize it, right? Distance from the center of the Earth, here's the Earth, we want this. Oh, how about this minus this gives me this? Yes? Uh, I have this on my calculator, so uh, minus. Earth is 6.38 times 10 to the 6th, I think. And I get an altitude of 8.47 times 10 to the 6th. There. Now I know exactly how high to put it. Of course, I bet you if we were doing this, we would keep the extra sig figs in real life. We'd probably want to at least be accurate to the nearest can of a meter. Now, this isn't perfect. Every satellite has to have some little booster rockets and stuff because the Earth isn't the only thing out there. The moon tugs on them, the sun tugs on them, and so there's some wobble, and so their orbits aren't perfectly smooth. We're simplifying a little bit, but very minimal adjustments. One of the things that used to drive us nerds crazy was in the old Star Trek series. In the original, and in the first couple of years of the next generation, until they actually listened to all the physics nerds, they would have the Enterprise in orbit, 
something would go wrong with the engines, and now they were in danger of classic tr crashing into the planet. No! If you're in orbit, they would have shut off the engines. Doesn't matter if the antimatter containment pods are about to blow. They're not going to crash into the planet. They might not be able to leave the planet. That's a different story. But that was, in the original series, a plot line very, very often. They're getting closer and closer and getting hotter and hotter as they're burning up in the atmosphere. we got to get the engines back. No, you, in real life, orbits are stable. You are in free fall. You just give yourself the right tangent velocity, and you fall continuously towards the planet in a curve that matches the planet's curve. B. All right, how fast is it going to be going up there? Um, I could probably use this radius to find how fast. Yeah, if I have to. Or maybe I can use the period to find how fast. Let's see. We're in orbit. Big G, big M, little m over R squared equals MV squared over R, because they're mentioning speed. You know what? It looks like no matter what, there's going to be an R kicking around. So, you know, as much as I dislike using information that I calculated to solve part two, yeah, I'll suck it up, buttercup, and deal with it, right? Oh, the mass does cancel. It's a... And... Are there R's on the bottom in both fractions? Then that cancels with that one. Oh, we've seen this equation before. V equals the square root of G M over R. Which is the square root of 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. M, big M. Oh, mass of the planet, Earth. All over. Oh, I got to use this number. 1.4848 times 10 to the 7. Okay. Once we get the satellite to the correct height, how fast will we have to get it moving sideways before we can just let it go and it'll stay there? You know, I really think... I can save myself some typing here. Yeah, I got that times that. Nuke this. Divided by. Square root. Do you get 5.2 times 10 to the 5,200? Ish. Seconds. Uh, seconds. Meters per second. It's not a period. It's a speed. Okay. So, I guess if we want the second equation for period, I guess technically the period ends up being the square root of, what was it going to be, 4 pi squared r cubed all over big G, big M. Yeah. Am I going to memorize that? Once you've done most of the homework, you'll find you can almost do this completely in your head. Yep. Stretch. Okay. Last one, I think. Example six. 
A satellite has an orbital altitude of 1.2 times 10 to the 6th meters. A, what's its radius? B, what's its velocity? And B, hey, how about make that a C? Whoops. What's its orbital period? Okay. What's its orbital radius if its altitude is 1.2 times 10 to the 6th? What do I have to do with that number? Okay. I'm just going to do that on my calculator. 1.2 times 10 to the 6th plus 6.38 times 10 to the 6th. You know what? Its radius is 7.58 times 10 to the 6th. Now, try B and C on your own. See if you can get them. I'm going to freeze the screen, see if we end up in the same place.
that right for B? Or no? Yeah? Is that right for C? Woohoo! These orbits. You can now, apl now all apply at NASA or the Canadian Space Agency. Nav, you could be an astronaut. Your childhood dream could be realized. What's your homework? Stuff to practice. I assigned with my other class. One, two, three, four, five, seven, nine, ten. Let me circle that on yours. Homework. One, two, three, four, five, seven, nine, ten. Take a look at number seven, by the way. Number seven is talking about a geosynchronous orbit. This is an orbit where the satellite stays above the same spot the whole time. For it to do that, what must its period be? Yeah. Which is what? How many hours for the Earth to go around once? Geosynchronous, so all the GPS satellites and many other geosynchronous satellites, they all orbit the Earth every 24 hours exactly. Of course, you have to change it to seconds by going times by 60, times by 60, but you actually know the period of a geosynchronous orbit, which means actually it turns out they're all at the same radius. It's not getting crowded because the circumference is huge, lots of room to spread stuff out, but will eventually. Then what? I don't know, hopefully by then we've left the planet. <laughs>